going to start this morning with the closing remarks and the briefing of our quality of life committee. Um, so that's all for our opening remarks this morning. And we'll go to the board. My mic on? Yes, it is. Okay, good. So You can shout it out. Okay. How many of you were at football meeting yesterday? Okay. You know how I like to walk around a little bit. I don't like to kind of sit behind this. And I'm going to give you a mini review of where we've been since July. Obviously focused at least initially on banking, right? So that's, then I'll give you some of my thoughts on what's happening in the industry, et cetera, et cetera. Welcome to another Big 12 basketball in the first season of the 16-team league. On the women's front, we've added four incredible programs to a league that has had six teams or more in the tournament for three straight years. Four of our women's programs are in the top 16 of the preseason AP poll for the first time in 2008. I'm incredibly bullish on our programs and women's basketball as a whole. We have some of the biggest names and best coaches in women's basketball. Fan interest is rife. Last season, Big 12 women's basketball viewership was up 111% year over year. We are taking all the right steps to maintain our status as a premier league for women's basketball. We've transitioned Dana Scherf into the role of VP of women's basketball, where she will continue the growth of our women's basketball in the Big 12. This season, we'll see 19 linear broadcasts of the Big 12 women's basketball, the most since the 2018-19 season. We are moving to an 18-game schedule, which I'm sure you're aware of, for comp conference play this season, and we'll, and we'll see how that goes. Um, for the second time, our women's championship will take place right here at T-Mobile, ensuring a best-in-class championship experience for not only our student athletes, but for our fans alike. Additionally, our women's championship game will now be played on Sunday on ESPN providing greater broadcast and fan exposure for the pinnacle of our season. If BYU earns a spot in the championship, the game will be pushed to Monday. Our men's basketball continues to be second to none. Four straight years, we've led the conferences in average net rankings. With the addition of the four corners, our league has become even stronger. Last week, the Big 12 became the first conference in history to have five teams in the top 10 of the AP preseason poll. Fan interest has never been higher. Our ratings are up, especially in that coveted younger viewership demographic. This is the third consecutive year we've seen viewership growth among younger season. This season, the spotlight will shine even greater. 93 men's games will be carried on linear television this season, the most since the 2018-19 season. This season will also see the de debut of an expanded partnership with CBS. At least 26 games per season will air across CBS sports platforms. This season will be our first ever 20 game schedule as we become a 16 team league for the first time. Last year, over 100,000 fans showed up for our championship. And we continue to work alongside the KC Sports Commission and T Mobile to ensure Big 12 championship experience will be an incredible one and a wonderful moment for our fans and student athletes. Before Studios, the league's first ever fast channel. Both of these platforms are introduced to further the Big 12's storytelling efforts and to ensure fans have Big 12 coverage, accessible coverage across the country. We also to con continue to prioritize our content strategy. The Big 12 has seen over 100,000 new followers across our media, social media channels since July. On the field and on the court, 
we've also seen great success. Big 12 Volleyball has six teams in the top 25. Next week, our soccer championship will kick off right here in Kansas City at the brand new KPKC Stadium, and we're thrilled about the opportunity to be there. During football media days in Vegas, we promised a season of parity, depth, and an exciting race to the Big 12 championship. So far, I'd say we've delivered, probably over-delivered in that respect. Right now, we are on pace to have multiple teams in the first ever 12-team college football playoff. Through eight weeks, seven Big 12 teams are either bowl eligible or one win away from eligibility. November, we'll see the launch of a brand campaign around the final month of league play, highlighting the must-see matchups as teams contend for the conference championship game. With basketball tipping off and football on the home stretch, the Big 12 will be must-see TV in November. This year's Big 12 football championship will be the culmination of an incredible season. Later this week, we'll announce this year's halftime performer. This Grammy-winning artist will be joined by the school bands for what will be an incredible show. Our industry is going through a period of change, but with change comes opportunities. I don't want to get into any specifics, but the Big 12 continues to explore impactful commercial opportunities. We also continue to look into the potential value of adding a strategic partner, someone who can come in and provide capital resources and business building strategy. I speak weekly with my A4 commissioners, and we continue to work, partner on a variety of initiatives and discussions for the future of college athletics, including settlement. I just want everyone to know there's great collaboration with our A4 commissioner colleagues, and I'm sure that will continue moving forward. Regarding the CFP, we cannot discuss changing the format before we even experience the 12-team playoff for the, for the first time this year. Let's be thoughtful about those discussions eventually, but let's see how it unfolds this year. I've said it before, there has never been a better time than right now to be part of the Big 12, for all the right reasons. We've completely reimagined this conference over the last 25 months, and we've become a truly national brand across 10 states and four time zones. I want to thank you for your continued support of the Big 12, of our basketball programs, and thank you all for being here today. Okay? Check. We're going to start with the Q&A portion. Um, raise your hand and you'll be identified and we will have one of our mic holders come find you. Uh, when you get called upon, please say your name and corresponding outlet. We'll start right here in the front. Brett Matthew Postens, Heartland College Sports. Good to see you. Um, between the boost in national games for men and women this year, what do you think accounts for that? Aside from the profile of the conference, did you guys make a concerted effort to get more men's and women's games on national television? I just think it's indicative of who we are and the brand we have, both on the men's and women's. Um, there's an appetite, you know, for great basketball content, and we're the number one basketball conference in America. Uh, so it makes sense that we have the biggest and broadest platforms to showcase our student athletes and our, our great member institutions. There, right up front. Kirkhoff with the Kansas City Star. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, I, I imagine over the next two days we'll hear coaches talk about how different the, the world is for them with NIL and transfer portal and everything, and even just last week, a, a major college basketball coach stepped down, and yet TV ratings for college football are, are really high, attendance is really high. What, what does that say about the, you know, where we are in college sports right now? Candidly, I don't think there's been a better time in, for college athletics than right now. Do we have our chal challenges? Of course we do, and we're addressing those challenges, and I'm spending a lot of time, as I said earlier, with my A4 commissioner colleagues, but you said it, attendance is up. Ratings are up, fan engagement is up, excitement across the country is up. And in some respects, when you think about football, Saturday is becoming bigger than Sunday. Um, but it's in a period of an adjustment right now. 
for our coaches, for our student athletes, for our fans, and we'll get through it. I'm very optimistic, but I'm very bullish on the future of college athletics. Do black t-shirt right up there. Keegan Nickerson with Bearcat Journal. Um, nice to see you. You've seen a growing trend of teams traveling two and three time zones struggling in football season. Are you guys looking at this basketball season with any adjustments coming to that? Is there any resources you guys can provide to kind of care for the student athletes better in those situations? When we do our scheduling uh, for any sport, um, given realignment and now being a 16-team league, we are very thoughtful in that process. We have guiding principles when it comes to travel and, and student-athlete well-being, uh, and those are at the top of the list. Uh, and I think our travel this year has been very manageable, um, but it's not just the conference. We're engaging with our schools, our coaches, different committees that we have formed to make sure we're doing the right thing by our student-athletes. Great. Scott, up in the front row. You hinted at the private equity. Is that going to become the norm? I'm sorry, Scott Springer from the Cincinnati Enquirer. Forgot that part. Um, private equity, will it become the norm well, in, you know, in everyone, college athletics? Everyone talks about private equity, and I, I don't really talk about private equity as much as I talk about should we be exploring a strategic partner, someone that provides capital resources mm -hmm. and, and strategy to help us build our business. There's no pride in authorship, and I'm a big believer in outsourcing to people that know more than we do. Um, does that mean we end up with a strategic partner? Maybe, maybe not. But it's incumbent upon me as the commissioner to explore every and all options, to make sure that we're as strong as we can be as a conference. So I'm doing my appropriate due diligence right now. Um, I don't have a crystal ball and who knows what the future holds when it comes to capital and how it makes its way into our ecosystem. Um, but from my perspective, I'm doing the appropriate due diligence on behalf of you know, the conference and we'll see where we land. But thank you for your question. Do John right here. Hey, Brett. John Kurtz with KC Sports Network. Um, with right here. Where's John? Oh, okay. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. With uh, with revenue sharing coming down the the pipe, how how realistic do you think it is for all your your member schools to be able to hit that that full revenue sharing number that's going to be there in year one? We we talk about rev share quite a bit. Um, I can tell you that our schools all want to continue to compete at the highest levels, and they'll do whatever they need to uh, in order to do that. Um, I can't sit here today to say that everyone's going to uh, spend up to the cap or not, but we're going to be competitive. Uh, we're one of the top conferences in America, and we'll continue to. Uh, to be that moving forward. One over here. Hi, uh, Bruce Pasco with the Arizona Daily Star. Uh, nice Brett, to see you and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, you've been pretty outspoken that you feel basketball is undervalued. I was wondering, is that a, what are you doing about that? Or is that something where you feel like uh, when the media rights is redone in, in 2030 or whatever that maybe it's separated? Or is there anything you're doing in between that can uh, maybe make more of that? Hey, listen, I've discussed it before since I've been here. I've been here now uh, about two years. Uh, I do think basketball is undervalued. I think there's real upside. I, I think there's potential growth um, to further monetize it, both short term and long term. Um, I look at our conference championship, and we have grown that from a revenue perspective uh, exponentially over the last two years. Uh, but ultimately, the, the big moment will be our next TV deal. And when we did the current new TV deal, what that kicks in next year, uh, we gave ourselves optionality on, on our back-end rights where we can go into the market again um, in, the, in a bundled fashion, which is historically done, or we could bifurcate basketball from football. We'll determine uh, what we'll do at that time. But uh, our, the growth of basketball is, I mean, I think we all see it. It's not just men's, it's women's. Um, you see those WNBA numbers, uh, record finals uh, uh, ratings. You saw that here last year in our tournament, um, um, you know, the NCAA tournament. So I think there's real upside, and um, uh, I'm looking to capture as much of that, both short-term and long-term, as I can. Go back to Blair real quick. Brett, um 
some conferences, power conferences, separate their men's and women's basketball tournament uh, sites. And the Big 12 used to do that. Why, why did you bring it under one roof? Or why, why did it come under one roof? Well, you know, I inherited it in Kansas City when I got here. And as I've said publicly, uh, having experienced it for the first time in spring of 23, we decided to double down shortly thereafter. You know, we're here through 31. Uh, we think it's a, it's a great destination, Kansas City. They embrace this tournament for all the right reasons. And obviously having the men's and women's back-to-back -back here, I think, gives us uh, a big voice and a big platform, um, which, which we enjoy and which is a very appropriate. It's also uh, geographically very desirable. It's, it's in the middle of our footprint, which I also think uh, played a role in us doubling down here in Kansas City. But we love it here. We love the building. We, we love our fan base. And uh, we'll be here, I'm sure, for a long time. Henry Green sign, Lawrence Journal World, over here. Um, following up on what you said a moment ago, oh. um, how can the Big 12 and its member schools best capitalize on the momentum that women's basketball has built up? Well, I, th I think we're doing it already. I mean, our, our, our schools are selling more tickets than they ever had. Our ratings are up. Um, the, the championship here for the first time at T-Mobile last year was incredible. Um, we go on sale later this week for ticket sales, and I expect those to um, grow uh, exponentially um, as we get closer to tournament time in March. So I think there's lots of different ways we can, we can grow it. We're, we're also, obviously, as you heard earlier, we'll have more linear broadcasts than ever before, uh, most since 2018-19. And um, original content that the conference is putting out continues to amplify and elevate women's basketball for all the right reasons. So we're excited about what it means for our student athletes, but also what it means for this conference. Okay, any other questions? We'll we get one more. Hi, uh, Brent, just wondering about the 20 game schedule with uh, men in particular. Is that, is that a long term plan and is there a rotation in mind or, or could it be different every year the way you break it up? We're going to see how it goes this year. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's set in stone. You know, we'll, we'll evaluate it with our coaches um, during the season and obviously following the season and we'll make. Uh, the determination at that point in time if this is something we want to stick to. Um, but 20 games, obviously, this year, and, and uh, we'll evaluate it as we move forward. One up in the front. Cindy Brunson, University of Arizona Women's Basketball. Brett, the addition of the four quarter schools to this conference the impact that will have right away as far as ratings go in your mind, how important is that to this expansion process? Listen, for me, the Four Corners, oh, that was a huge get for us across the board. You know, when I think about the ecosystem, I mean, it's, it's helped us in football, it's helped us in women's and uh, men's basketball and obviously Olympic sports. So I think uh, as you look at viewership currently and what it's, what's going to unfold throughout the first season of the Four Corners being part of the Big 12, I think you're going to see a lot of ratings increases, uh, men's and women's sports. So we're excited about it. Uh, it gives us a national footprint, gets us into a different time zone. Um, so it's exactly what we had hoped for, and it's playing out each week right now. Got one more. Sorry, if I could follow up on my schedule question. When you mentioned, uh, I believe it was travel procedures you had or, or scheduling, um, what are those? And, and, and some of the, in some of the cases, uh, are you, for example, protecting geographic rivals going forward? Where We're protecting rivalries, which I think is and, critically important. When you think about football as an example, if you cross two time zones one week, you get the bye the following week. Those principles are, are being carried over to men's and women's basketball and other uh, other sports, obviously, you know, within our portfolio. So student-athlete well-being is critically important. Travel is something we're, we're very mindful of, and it's very much a, a part of our, our scheduling process and will continue to be for all the right reasons. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.